We're in a bit of a, a period time machine here. In the age of the machine, every decade is defined by its engineering masterpieces. So join me on a journey through time as I experience the great machines that changed people's lives and shaped modern Britain. The 1980s was a turning point for Britain. It was out with the old and in with the new. After a decade of strikes, oil crises and a steady decline in our manufacturing industries, the country was close to bankruptcy. Britain's first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, or the Iron Lady, called for new thinking, new ways of doing business. Out of the ashes of the old ways, a new spirit of invention and ambition was emerging. This was the dawn of the computer age, advanced materials and electronics. For me, the 1980s was the decade when modern Britain finally arrived. Ah, hello, Maggie. What's that you say? The future has landed? In the 1980s, the car was the star. In 1985, one British car found fame as a time machine in the blockbuster movie Back to the Future. The director, Robert Zemeckis, was after a car that would look like a UFO. The shiny, futuristic DeLorean was just the job. It made its first leap through time in typical 80s fashion, by remote control. As Doc said to Marty, if my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're gonna see some serious, uh, stuff. The movie was a huge hit. But ironically, this sci-fi icon had already been taken out of production. What on earth was going on? It all began with John DeLorean, automotive wunderkind and vice president of America's General Motors. In 1973, he quit his high-paid job to pursue his dream. To design and produce a car of his own. A car that would be far ahead of its time. DeLorean set out to defy the conventions of automobile manufacture by making a unique-looking machine with the performance of a sports car for the price of a family saloon and, this is the radical bit, to make a car that would last a lifetime. DeLorean called in Colin Chapman from the Lotus Formula One team to engineer the car, and in 1981, backed to the tune of £88 million by the British government, the DMC-12 went into production. It's pretty well known that things didn't go according to plan. DeLorean went bankrupt very publicly, and his car was widely slated. But what's been lost in the mists of time is whether the DMC was actually any good. I've come to a very special workshop hidden away in Kent to check out the engineering behind the icon. The vast majority of cars like this classic XJS use regular steel body panels. It's strong, it's cheap, pretty much ideal for mass producing cars. But if you don't keep it in absolutely perfect condition, it rusts. So you either had to restore the car or go out and buy a new one. DeLorean wanted his cars to last a lifetime, so he used stainless steel instead. Yes, the DeLorean's striking coat is bare, rust-resistant metal. But you don't see many cars made of this stuff. Stainless steel isn't cheap. Neither were the impressive, now famous, gullwing doors. The doors were intended to give the look of a bird in flight, all part of DeLorean's grand plans for a design that would make people stop and stare. But their steel torsion bars and hydraulic rams proved very expensive, 
and the cool doors also created a serious safety issue. DeLorean planned a one-piece molded plastic body shell for his car. It seemed like a clever, cheap solution. But Colin Chapman from Lotus took one look at the designs and knew there was a problem. A plastic body with massive gaps for the doors just wouldn't be safe with a heavy rear-mounted V6 engine. So Chapman redesigned the DMC with a steel chassis. Simple solution, but not cheap. Despite spiralling costs, DeLorean's dream car went into production and was launched in January 1981. The commercial said, drive the DeLorean, live the dream today. You even received a letter from him outlining his hopes for your car. Handle well, be enormous fun to drive, last a lifetime. Well, let's see if it measures up, shall we? Critics called the DeLorean sluggish with poor handling, which you wouldn't expect from a 2.8 litre V6. Yeah, I'll say this for it, it does go a bit. The problem was DeLorean's target market was America, where road laws demanded catalytic converters which sat 25% of the engine's power and raised suspension, making it wallow around corners. Not great for a sports car. Thankfully, I'm enjoying an unmodified UK version. I'm left with the conclusion that maybe DeLorean almost achieved what he was trying to do in terms of the cost of a family saloon, the performance of a sports car, and a car that would last a lifetime. To stay afloat, DeLorean needed to sell 10,000 cars a year, but didn't come close. A mixture of overambition, market misjudgment, and Lotus re-engineering doubled the price to £12,000, or $25,000 for the American market. And it simply wasn't a $25,000 sports car. After less than two years in production, with only 9,000 cars in existence and DeLorean embroiled in scandal, the company went bankrupt. DeLorean did, however, achieve his dream of a car that would last a lifetime. Three decades into the future, this one's still shining. A great sci-fi icon, but a commercial failure. At least the DMC-12 had shown there was huge potential to shake up industry with new ideas and new technology. And the British government had shown that it was willing to try new ways of doing business. In the early 80s, new ideas and new thinking swept across Britain. New looks, new music, new uh, romantics. And there was a new brand of incisive political satire on the scene, too. <laughs> Whole new industries were starting up, fueled by revolutions in electronics and computers. And Britain was very much in the frame thanks to one of Prime Minister Maggie Thatcher's favourite eccentric entrepreneurs. Sir Clive Sinclair was the hero of all those British school children who could persuade their parents to buy them a computer. To help them with their homework, of course. With the brilliant ZX Spectrum, Sinclair introduced the world's smallest and cheapest home computer, just £125. Right, paper there, paper there. Right, paper there. Slow down. Slow down. How do I have to go slow down? No, I wasn't going to hit that. I'm sorry. How were people entertained by this back then? I'll never know. But I'm finding it strangely addictive. Let's go again. Oh, 
Thanks to Clive. Sinclair wasn't just a computer boffin, and in 1985 he revealed his next trailblazing creation to the world. Welcome to the future, the Sinclair C5. Was it a car? Was it a bike? This was step one of Sinclair's vision for the future of electric vehicles. It was actually an electric tricycle. By keeping the speed below 15 miles an hour and the weight below 60 kilos, Sinclair was able to build an electric vehicle that needed no road tax, no insurance and no driving license. You didn't even need a crash helmet. It sounds clever, and although I've never heard anything good said about the C5, I suppose I should at least give it a chance. Right, I'm approaching a gentle hill now, and this, I feel, may well be a, some sort of challenge for it. I do have the finger firmly on the button, and it's getting embarrassing. Yes, I'm going to have to give it a little bit of pedal assistance. Reversing was, I would have said, not one of its strongest. Uh, in fact, it doesn't reverse. I'm doing the reversing now. Um, so embarrassing. And I've forgotten the expression that uh, Sinclair <laughs> gave it, but it's a sort of 80 point turn <laughs> using your legs. It's a useless machine, really. <laughs> Now it's bleeping at me. Sorry, Sir Clive. I just can't find your trademark genius in this machine. Geronimo! Before I write it off, I'm going to meet a real-life C5 engineer from the 80s. Can Adam Harper turn me into a believer? Now let's start with the battery, which I gather is, is a third of of the weight of the, the entire vehicle. But it is a special battery. It's uh, designed to be recharged many, many times. Right, let's move on to this item here, which to me looks like a small washing machine motor. The car was assembled by Hoover, and many years ago uh, it was written um, that it was a washing machine motor. And the, the fact is, it never was. Um, it, it was a specially designed motor by Phillips, uh, and it was a technical breakthrough. The last item is this rather odd shape. It looks one end of a clothes rail t to me. Um, Adam, tell me all about it. It's a box section chassis. Clive went along to Lotus Sports Cars, and so they designed uh, this chassis, um, which is a fantastic piece of engineering because it's immensely strong and weighs Next nothing. nothing. It's, it's, uh... well, I suppose with the battery weighing half a ton, something's got to be light. You've got to, yeah. <laughs> So maybe there is more to this machine than meets the eye. And its iconic body shell is high-tech too. Sinclair's team spent months improving the aerodynamics in a wind tunnel, making it 75% more efficient than a regular cycle. The better the aerodynamic efficiency, the further you could go on one charge. About 20 miles, according to the brochure. Sinclair's runabout went on the market in January 1985 for just under £400, a £1,000 in today's money. But before it even hit the streets, most journalists were writing it off. Right from the start, the C5 scared people. They thought its low profile would be too dangerous once you get out amongst the trucks and cars. Was that fair? Let's find out. I've got a full charge and a tune-up, and it's time to give the C5 a second chance. Off to the supermarket, 1980s style. And you get amazing looks from people thinking, that person there is completely mad, and they'd be right. On a flattish road, it rolls along at a decent lick, with no effort on my part. There we go, we're successfully around there. In the traffic, one does feel incredibly vulnerable. This 
isn't even a busy road. You've got to give credit to Sir Clive. He put his reputation and £7 million behind his creation. OK, so the boot's a bit small. In fact, the machine is far from perfect. But it's actually quite a bit better than I expected. Bad press may have killed off the C5, but the idea of electric runabouts just hasn't gone away. With better batteries and electric motors, Sinclair's vision is finally becoming reality with quiet, clean electric machines that even have decent sized boots. Maybe Sinclair was just a bit too far ahead of his time. Although both the DeLorean and the C5 were commercial failures, they were iconic trailblazers that embodied the pioneering spirit of 1980s Britain.